Well, beloved in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How our sermon study today is taken from the book of Numbers. However, this Old Testament reading fits today's gospel reading from John like a surgical glove fits a hand. Because both texts, in fact, even today's epistle reading, clearly reveal God's merciful grace offered to us in his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. So as we study our Old Testament reading today, we will also look at the other readings for a richer understanding of this most magnificent text. Today's reading was our Old Testament reading from the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 4 through verse 9. I would ask if you're able, please rise for the reading of God's word. From Mount Or, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us now in its truth. Your words are truth. Thank you. Please be seated. Now for a bit more context to today's scripture, the Israelites on their incredible exodus out of Egypt started out for Canaan, the land which God had promised to them. Because of a series of events, travel to the promised land took many, many years. And specifically here in today's scripture, because of the king of Edom, he refused to let them go through his land or his borders when they were heading north. So the Israelites had to turn all the way around and retrace their steps back to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. So they essentially had to go backwards to go forwards. And this caused much discouragement among the people. And to make matters worse, this backwards trek took the Israelites through a horrible desert with a loose, sandy soil where terrible sandstorms sometimes arose from the neighborhood of the Red Sea. It was during this time that the Israelites encountered heat and drought and sickness, suffering, and death. This detour caused the people to become irritated and annoyed at God and Moses. So they began once more to complain and criticize, something the Israelites were getting quite good at and doing a lot of it during their travels to the Promised Land. Nevertheless, because of how long this trek out of Egypt was taking, the souls of the people became very discouraged. Comprehending this whole endeavor, we can, I suppose, understand this discouragement, can't we? After all, by a direct route, this entire journey out of Egypt to the Promised Land should have taken them no more than a month or more to arrive at their destination. But because of the people's lack of faith, and not trusting in God and the direction he was giving them and their lack of courage and their incessant griping against Lord and against Moses, they encountered one difficulty after another. In fact, because of their continual complaining against the Lord and his called servant Moses, 
They were literally led around in circles for 40 years before they were permitted to enter into their new home. And even then, only two individuals from the generation of people who had been freed from their Egyptian captivity, Joshua and Caleb, were allowed to go in. All of the others, those who had grumbled against the Lord or slandered his name, died in the wilderness and were not allowed to enter the promised land. So the people, after their long and arduous journey, which was nearing the end of this 40-year period, were now quite restless and impatient and very dissatisfied. This is where we'll pick up our story. Our text tells us the people spoke against God and against Moses, their spiritual leader, saying, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Now thinking about this complaint, it's a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? I mean, the people are complaining about having no food, yet they loathe the food God has given them. And... God had certainly given them water many times throughout their journey too. But here they go again, complaining and murmuring against God by despising the food that God had so graciously given them. And the food that they were whining about was the manna that God sent from heaven to feed them, the food of the angels. And by all biblical description, manna was delicious. But now the people decided that they were tired of that. So they rebelled against God and his gifts and the way he was taking care of them. So God responds. He responds to their disobedience like he had done many times before with punishment. Only this time his punishment is particularly intense. He sends poisonous fiery serpents among the people whose venomous bite caused many Israelites to die. You know, when we think of serpents, snakes, it brings to mind a pretty visual picture, doesn't it? I'll also assume that, like me, you guys don't like those slithering creatures either. The truth is I'm a real chicken when it comes to snakes, spiders too. Perhaps you are too. And while snakes are certainly beneficial predators when it comes to God's way of controlling rodents and the fact that most snakes are more afraid of humans than humans are afraid of snakes, I still don't like them. I don't like them one bit. The snakes described here in our text are called fiery serpents. And our best indication is that they were a particularly dangerous species that can still be traced to that same area in the Middle East today. And if assumptions are correct, these snakes produced a very poisonous venom for which there was no antidote. And the bite of this particular species is known to be hot and extremely painful, causing raging fevers and agonizing deaths. So, if you got bit, you died. And just imagine being in a tent in the wilderness and hundreds if not thousands of these poisonous snakes start slithering toward you from all directions. That would be a terrifying scene. So this whole ordeal was a most horrifying event. So the Israelites are complaining and murmuring against God like they had done many times before. So God, like he had done many times before, punishes them for their sin. This time by sending venomous snakes into their camp to bite and kill many faithless people. When we consider God's chosen people, the Israelites, a question that certainly comes to mind is why did they complain so much? After all, God kept his promise to multiply Abraham's descendants into a great and powerful nation. God delivered them from slavery in Egypt, making them wealthy in the process. 
He led them out to the promised land. He gave them a mighty leader in Moses to guide them in the teachings of God, teach them the, the Ten Commandments along with all the other laws governing Israel's life and worship. Laws that kept them healthy, wealthy, and unfortunately not too wise. <laughs> and yet, all the Israelites seemed to do over and over and over again was disobey God and then complain when he punished them for their sinful disobedience. And that, friends, is a hint. So what caused them to be so irritable with life and so ungrateful to God and his called servant Moses who was simply looking out for their spiritual lives and what was best for them eternally? What was it that made them so ungratefully impertinent? Well, it's the same thing that has always made people ungratefully impertinent. Sin. The great apostle Paul described it for us quite well in today's epistle reading. Ephesians 2 verse 1 and 2 reads, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You see, what caused the people to protest against God and his servant Moses was the other serpent that's described in Scripture. That crafty serpent found in the garden, Satan, the prince of the power of the air, that old serpent which is the devil, he's the one that's behind all the evil and sinfulness of the world. So he's the one who was behind the Israelites speaking against God and speaking against Moses. Satan's the one that got the people all riled up, resentful, crabby, and unsatisfied with the many blessings that God had bestowed upon them. The truth is, friends, nothing's changed much, has it? You see, if you find yourself irritable, if you find yourself ill-mannered to others, perhaps even those who are bending over backwards to help you out, Perhaps even those men of God who have been placed over you in the Lord to keep watch over your soul. Whenever you find yourself cantankerous, it's always Satan who is behind that sin. Now, some who find themselves in these situations would attempt to excuse themselves by saying, well, the devil made me do it. And while that's certainly true, you need to know that we are not excused for our sinful behavior because the devil made me do it. You see, if we allow the devil to rule our lives, we are as guilty as the devil and will surely share his eternal fate. But make no mistake about it, the devil is the one behind all sin. And the Bible tells us to be always alert to his tactics and deceit. It says to be sober-minded and watchful because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So all the doubts and all the complaining against God and Moses was certainly because of the devil. And that's the reason God took such swift lawful, punishing action against the Israelites. When God sent the fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died, something good came out of that punishment. The people recognized their sin and they genuinely repented of it, seeking God's merciful forgiveness. And even though they had been down this road before, even though they had experienced God's reprimand many times because of their lack of faith, because of their falling away from God's law, because of their wanting to be God of their own lives, the people came before Moses with remorseful hearts, confessing their sin before him. 
You see, the swift and lawful punishment from God caused the people to see the sin they had committed against God and against Moses. So they openly confessed their sin to Moses and begged him to deliver them from the plague through his intercession with the Lord. Numbers 21 verse 7 reads, And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. So Moses goes before God in prayer. And the Lord has a wonderful and immediate answer for the people. You see, God in his merciful grace and love for all people stood ready to forgive them for their sins. And loved ones, it's that same way today. God stands ready to forgive and forget our sins. The very instant we come before him in true repentance seeking his forgiveness. We who have sinned, we who are ungrateful and totally undeserving, if we turn to God to confess our sins, God is gracious and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And no matter the sin we confess before God, no matter how ashamed we may be of our sin, the very instant, the second we ask God for his forgiveness, he forgives us. And that's what Yahweh, the Lord God, did for the Israelites. He immediately, after the people asked to be forgiven of their sins, took Moses to make a fiery serpent and put it up on a high pole in the camp where it would be visible for the people to see. Let's read the text. Numbers 21, 8, 9 reads, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now sometimes when we see an image of this text or picture in our minds as we read the story in the Bible, we mostly imagine a few people standing around looking up at a snake on a pole to live. That, however, would be an incorrect depiction of the situation. Why? Well, at this time in Israel's history, they had a population of about 600,000 men of military age. And if you figure in their wives and children, it's quite possible that the total population would be somewhere close to two and a half million people, not to mention all their livestock and their housing, etc. So this meant that the Israeli camp would have covered many, many square miles. And that means that an Israelite wouldn't be able to simply peek out their head out of the tent flap and look up at the serpent on the stick. <laughs> it would have been a long walk for many people to even be able to see the bronze serpent on the pole and live. And realizing this helps us to better understand just how dramatic and powerful and miraculous this whole episode really is. So at the command of God, Moses makes a serpent, puts it up on a pole, and everyone who looked up at this serpent would live and survive the snake bite. And the serpent was to be made of brass or copper because the color of this metal when the sun was shining upon it was most like the appearance of the fiery serpents. And thus, the symbol would be more like the thing itself. But just how were these people saved? Was there something magical about this serpent? Was it a special kind of bronze or copper, other metal, that Moses used to fashion this snake? Was the wood that was used for the pole unique in some way? Nope. It was just a snake made from bronze or copper, 
and put up on a tall pole. So then how were the people saved? Well, the healing power of the fiery serpent depended entirely on the promise of God. You see, what saved the people was their trusting faith in the power of God's Word. And the looking up to live was not some casual glance up at a snake on a pole which even an unbelieving Israelite might cast upon the figure, but to the sincere look of faith resting upon the divine promise of God that they would be healed. It was a deep, deep gaze, a reflective acknowledgement of their sin and a genuine longing for deliverance from its penalty. It was a true trusting in the means of grace appointed by God for healing sounds a little sacramental-ish, doesn't it? God's command, do this, and God's promise, and you will live, is attached to something real, visible, and tangible, the bronze serpent on a pole. So in a way, the bronze serpent is like the means that the Holy Spirit uses to bring salvation. And whether we consider hearing the Word of God, confession and absolution, holy baptism, or the Lord's Supper, these means of grace all depend on the promise of God for their effectiveness. Like Luther says in his explanation of baptism, and I quote, without God's Word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the Word of God, it is a baptism. That is a life-giving water, rich in grace, and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. Friends, this whole incident that's before us today is a wonderful expression on just how simple salvation is. It's all about faith. For the Israelites, when they cried out to God for forgiveness, God didn't say, nope, you got to lay in your bed for a while. You made the mess, now you lay in it. No, immediately God told Moses what to do to provide a deliverance for the people. And that is key, friends. Because this deliverance that God provided required nothing from the people at all. They don't have to now also make amends for what they've done. They don't have to somehow try or even up the score with God before he provides for them. No, nothing of the sort. They simply have to trust in God's promise that everyone who looks up to this bronze serpent lives. And that's how simple faith is. You see, faith is not something we do. Faith isn't something that is measured as in a strong faith is better for salvation than a weak faith, being somehow inferior. No. Faith is a gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Ah. But our lesson can also show us how faith can be misunderstood. Because it is true that sometimes people think that faith is something I do, as in, if I have enough faith, then I'll be healed. If, I, if my faith is just the right way, then I'll have eternal life. I mean, after all, those Israelites did have to look up at that snake, right? But loved ones, that's wrong. That's not how faith works. That's not how faith ever works. That's nothing more than works righteousness. You see, taking the position that faith is more than just receiving what God gives, as if faith was somehow adding something to what God has done, is not only damnable, 
But it also robs God of his glory. So we never want to pervert the Bible's clear understanding of faith as a free gift from God offered to us through the gospel into something we do. Now I hope you can clearly see that within this wonderful lesson from the Old Testament, we are given a very vivid picture of a trusting faith. But there's still a bit more to see here. Because what's embedded in this historical event is the rich theology that our gospel reading from today brought to light. In other words, this wonderful text from the pages of the Old Testament is a beautiful artistic shadow of the things to come. You see, while the bronze serpent on a pole had the form of a real serpent, it was without poison and altogether harmless. In the same way, God sent his son in the form of sinful flesh, and yet without sin. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So this entire episode from the Old Testament is a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ and the promise of God to all who would believe and trust in him. Listen to these words our Lord God would later speak to Nicodemus taken from our gospel lesson read earlier today. John 3, 14 through 17 reads, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus very explicitly is telling Nicodemus that what happened with the serpent on a pole was a type of Christ. In other words, Christ is the anti-type of the serpent inasmuch as he took upon himself the most wicked and vile potencies of sin and made a vicarious atonement for it. So the fiery serpent on a pole was a prophetic revelation of what would happen to our Lord Christ as he was lifted up on the cross for the sins of the entire world. So our scripture is not just a historical recording of a bronze serpent put on a pole in the wilderness as the Israelites were approaching the promised land. No. The true significance of this text is that this is a portrayal of Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of all people and saving everyone who believes and trusts in God's promise to do so. That is why Jesus acknowledged to Nicodemus that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And later on in John's Gospel, it's recorded that Jesus also said, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Which means, Jesus makes atonement for everyone's sins and draws people out of every nation to form his church. Now, regrettably, this does not mean that everyone in the world will enter heaven. Why? Well, to receive God's gift of eternal life, one must first possess a saving faith in what Christ Jesus did for you. You must believe and trust in the Lord Christ and believe and trust that he was lifted up for your sins on the cross, died and was buried and rose again to be saved. And that's important, friends. That's believing in God's promise of a Savior. Our
Our scriptures today teach us that just as the serpent of bronze hung on a pole in order to save the Israelites from the venomous snake bite, so Jesus hung on a cross in order to save the entire world from the poison of sin. Which means the bloody cross is the only answer to your sin and mine. Loved ones, every single one of us are serpent-bitten people, born in sin, ready to be used by Satan. And all of us have disobeyed God's holy law. And there is not one of us who is exempt. The snake bite of sin is in us all. Our only hope is to cry out to God and confess like the Israelites, Lord, we have sinned. Please help us. Friends, Jesus is the one and only source for life and deliverance. And his promise to abide with us and give us life abundantly in him is through his word and sacrament found here in his church. In other words, through his very word and promise of life, which he attaches to simple words, plain water, and ordinary bread and wine, our deliverance is given. Our deliverance is secured. Are these things supernatural in and of themselves? No. Does our faith add the missing portion of life as if Christ's gift of life and word and sacrament are in some way inadequate without our additions? God does his part, now you need to do yours? Nope. Does the rest of the world think we're crazy for believing such things? Yes, they do. But this is God's eternal word and promise of life salvation and forgiveness and as Lutheran Christians this is the very foundation of who we are and what we believe salvation is ours by faith alone in God's means of grace alone because of Christ Jesus and his atoning death on the cross for my sins alone so look up to the cross Fix your eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. People loved by God, Christ died for you. And you and I will live eternally by believing God's wonderful promise that he came to this earth to save. Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for your words today. Allow the Holy Spirit now to penetrate into the hearts and minds of all the hearers of this word and allow that wonderful spirit to open within us a new life in Christ or strengthen the life that we have in Christ. Father, your words are powerful. Your gospel, your Old Testament, everything is wonderfully put together for us to believe. Let the Holy Spirit now work that saving faith in us to believe. In Christ's holy and precious name, we thank him and we pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen.